Are you struggling to hack and slash your way through the incredible burden of choice and arrive at a properly viable shortlist of medium SUVs? The better to avoid making a horrible mistake after you've dropped the big bucks on the wrong one. If that's you, dude, I'm going to show you exactly how to do this. I'm John Logan from AutoExpert.com.au and I get new cars cheap. Plenty of SUVs too, just saying that's the way the market has evolved recently. But Australia only. Website, card. Now, medium SUVs. Have a guess, pick a number, how many different models of medium SUV are available for you to choose from in Australia today. Have a guess now, pick a number. There's 44, right? 22 mainstream ones and 20 premium ones. The difference being mainstream, under 60 grand, notionally. Premium, over 60 grand. And my challenge to you right here and right now is get yourself a piece of paper and write down just 10 of them. Bet you can't do it. And that's the first problem. I'll be back to you with more on this in just a sec. This report is sponsored by NordVPN. Now, I'm not a hardcore IT guy, but I've heard enough, especially recently, about data breaches, scams and hacks to know that being online can be inherently risky and costly. You don't have to be tech savvy to use NordVPN. It's a simple one-stop cybersecurity solution. One click and you are protected from hackers, malware and pop-ups across as many as six devices. NordVPN is the world's fastest VPN. I don't even notice it running in the background, frankly, and it only costs about as much as a cup of coffee to keep your data, your identity, and your devices secure every month. NordVPN can also save you money because you can assign your virtual location to another country where, for example, flights and accommodation might be cheaper than they are back at home. The same goes for streaming services, and you can access live sporting events and other content that may not be available where you actually live. It's a pretty small price to pay for cyber security, not to mention the potential savings also on the table. Go to nordvpn.com slash AEJC to get a huge discount off your plan plus four months free. Totally risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. That's nordvpn.com slash AEJC. Link in the description. And thanks to Nord for sponsoring this episode. You know, one of the big problems for car makers is just making you aware of the existence of their vehicle, their medium SUV, their large 4x4, their little hatchback, whatever. The market is so burdened with choice that just blipping on your radar is the preeminent marketing challenge. And if you want to look at how the market has evolved, there's been a spectacular sort of realignment of buyer preferences in the Australian vehicle market since about 2010. So much so that our good friends T-Dub and the Spice Girls have prepared a helpful graph while they were on tour, let's call it. Yellow on the graph is the death of passenger cars since 2010. It's like, whoo, nobody wants them anymore, seemingly. And mauve is the rise of SUVs. And this colour, this particular shade of mauve, was chosen specifically by T-Dub, as I understand it. The dude could have been one of the country's best, what well, the world's best, really, interior designers, but he left that all behind to follow his passion and become a lobbyist. It takes real bravery to do something like that, I'd suggest. He's such a cool dude. <laughs> Purple is the rise of the Bogan Ute. It's the light commercials, and they're nudging up. Very popular in specific terms, but in volume, not so much. So Bogans can no longer buy hot Commodores and Falcons, right? So Bogans still exist in the market. They need to focus on something. And the obvious something for a Bogan to focus on is the 4x4 fully loaded dual cab ute where they can take it to AR friggin' B and just go, mate, just get started and I'll tell you when to stop.
kind of thing, right? We've all seen those youths in the market out there on the road, but the volume, the real increase in volume has been the death of passenger cars supplanted by the rise of SUVs. And the biggest category of SUV by sales is medium SUV. So bigger than a Kona, smaller than a Fortuna kind of thing. That's what we're talking about here, RAV4-sized SUVs, right? And I don't know how you went naming just 10 of them. I'm going to concentrate on the mainstream ones here, of which there are 22 different choices currently available. Incredibly enough. And I guess... The big problem today, of course, is that people either don't have the time or they're not prepared to devote the time to doing the research properly for this kind of purchase. They tend to spend more time planning a holiday or let's call it a um, business trip with the boss's secretary, right? That tends to take more time than choosing a new car. People sort of jump cut through the new car choice process and they do it spectacularly badly. They don't have time to identify the 22 vehicles that they could choose in this category. They certainly don't make a list and just for complete disambiguation, if you want that list in alphabetical order, I'll give it to you right now. It's the BYD Atto 3, the Citroen C5 Aircross, the Cupra Formentor. Who thinks of these names? The Ford Escape, the Great Wall Motors, Havel H6 and the H6 GT. I'm including the GT with the H6. Honda CRV, Hyundai Tucson Jeep, Cherokee, Kia Sportage, Mazda CX-5, MGHS, Mitsubishi Outlander, Nissan X-Trail, the Peugeot 3008 and the Peugeot 5008, Renault Colios, Skoda Karok, Sanyon Carando, Subaru Forester, Toyota RAV4, two Volkswagens, the Golf Alltrack and the Tiguan. So, how do you get from this massive list of 22 down to just a viable short list so that you can go, well, here are the options, the best options, which one are we going to choose? And most people do not do this rationally. See, I get all these emails all the time. My friggin', oh yeah, bin cam, working on it. I get all these emails all the time from people who are in the market now, because that's kind of the business that I'm in, and they use the kookiest logic, like non-logic. And I'll give you a couple of examples. The most common kinds of propositions sent to me by the would-be buyers of medium SUVs and all other categories of vehicle, frankly. One goes like, my wife just loves the Volkswagen Tiguan. Her friend Melissa has one. We drove one at the weekend and it seemed so much nicer than our 15-year-old Kia Rio. What do you think? And I'd suggest that, well, Volkswagens are quite nice-looking cars that drive reasonably well, but let's not forget, if Volkswagen were a person, it would still be in the US federal penitentiary for conspiracy felonies. That's just a fact. Most people get more than five years in the big house for conspiracy, I'd suggest. So there's that, there's the poor reliability and the even worse customer support. And there's also the fact that if any new car doesn't feel better than your 15 year old shitbox, then the car industry's done, some, done something profoundly wrong, have they not, in the intervening decade and a friggin' half or something. So comparing a new car, a one-off test drive of a new car with your present shitbox, Probably a bad way to justify the purchase. Also, not investigating the underlying character and performance, support, culture, whatever, of a car maker is also a bit of a fail. That's what I really think. People make the mistake of asking me what I think by email and they get so offended when I tell them. Go figure. Another common inquiry is, we're about to retire. We 
we want to buy our next Honda CRV. It's going to be our fifth Honda. We just love Honda. Honda's clearly the leading Japanese car maker with the highest quality and reliability. Can you help? I say, yeah, dude. Go and see a neurologist because there's something seriously wrong upstairs. You haven't been paying attention. There's no excuse for this unless you've been spending the, ne the decade and a half dead from the neck up because you, I don't know, work in Parliament House or something. Come on. Some car makers used to be something and now they're nothing. And Honda is certainly one of those. And if you've only driven... Hondas for the past couple of decades or whatever. How do you have any appreciation for where the market is at right now and the relativities of the different brands and who's going to look after you and where the best value is and things of that nature? That This kind of approach, which is very common, is just insane and it leads people down exactly the wrong staircase. The one marked automotive hell and you don't want to go down that one at least i don't just pay a stern german woman with a paddle for one hour a month worth of her time It'd be about as painful and less expensive ultimately i'd suggest so this is not the way to buy a new car at least not rationally and i'd also suggest that it's not about the road test right on apples for apples criteria Say, if you decide that you want a petrol automatic medium SUV for 45 grand or something, they're all going to drive about the same. And yeah, sure, there will be nuances between them, but the road test is not where the major differences between these vehicles lie. They really, it's really not where it is. If you're buying a performance car, then how it drives, the nuance is really important. If you're just buying a family SUV and you've narrowed it down to we're going to spend about 45 grand and I want a petrol automatic, then the road test is not where the main meat of the decision is. It's just not. They've all got about the same features. They all drive about the same. That's not how you do this. This is why I don't spend infinity time out there road testing cars for you because making the right choice is not about the road test, okay? It's just not. The easiest, smartest, simplest, most efficient way to do this, to get from 22 different vehicles, blah, 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 how do I just come to grips with it, down to your shortlist, the smart shortlist. The easiest, most efficient way to do that is by a process of elimination. It's like when you get to hospital, to the emergency department, and they do triage. They decide who can wait and who needs help now. It's not first come, first served, right? You're going to do a triage-like process. But what we're really... Yes! What we're really talking about today is eliminating the crap. You've also got to realise, and we are getting to the whole elimination process, trust me, but you've also got to realise that the car maker's brochure, which you might download as a PDF or, heaven forbid, actually go to the dealership where you can get stitched up and take as a hard copy if you get away with your skin intact and <laughs> your bank balance, the brochure and the website, they're really not that helpful. Like, they're pretty helpful on the specs and you can look at pictures and, you know, you can see the interior and the exterior and all of that kind of stuff. But when it comes to actually doing the triage and making the decision, the brochure and the website are just there to give you a thousand reasons, a million reasons, why their vehicle is not just good but excellent and certainly better than all of that other shit in the competition. A million reasons for that and absolutely no reasons why you should not buy it or why another vehicle should be better. So if you're making a decision based on your website, visitation experience with the car maker or the brochure or something of that nature, you're getting this wrong. I'd further suggest that friends and family, although they try to be helpful, they're often just complete wombats when it comes to giving you viable information to help you make the right choice, okay? So nobody wants to admit 
that they just made a $50,000 mistake, do they? I mean, you have to have a properly relationship ripping apart experience at the dealership for you to start admitting that you just spent 50 grand on the wrong car to your closest friends and family members, right? If you're just secretly not that happy but prepared to live with it, someone's going to walk up to you at the next barbecue and say, mate, how's the new Tiguan or whatever? How's the new Cherokee, right? And you're likely to say, yeah, yeah, it's great. Oh, I love it. Right? Instead of going, should have bought whatever else, aren't I a dick? Right? These are the options, conversationally. Right? Nobody wants to admit making a mistake. And the other thing is, the benefit of this information, this advice from family and friends, might be based on their zero research and just jumping because they fell in love with a particular car online or they saw it in traffic or Jenny's mum's got one, right? Sort of thing. And it's lovely. If it's that, then this is just one step removed from you making exactly the same mistake. So friends and family, generally unhelpful. And I'd also suggest that mainstream reviews, like road test reviews, which purport to be independent, are really not. There's two major conflicts of interest with reviews, right? They're not really done for you, although they seem to be done in this way. They're really done to keep the car maker sweet so that the publisher can continue to enjoy the tap being fully opened on the river of advertising gold. Like, say nice things about us and we'll reciprocate, we'll give you a reach around with some advertising revenue and then the circle of life will continue, the circle of publishing life anyway. And the other thing is the journo might want to say particular things to you, but he's sitting there self-censoring because he doesn't want to get in the shit with his boss. And he's also sitting there going, you know what, I really do want to get invited back on these gigs because they are quite nice. And as I understand it, the next big launch from Blah is in Barcelona. And if I say nice things now and they like it, they might invite me back, right? Not that helpful to you. So all of these channels can provide you with some information, the brochure, the friends, the family, the independent reviews. But if you just use them, you're really not doing this smart and you're likely to make the wrong decision, which I don't want you to do because however much you're spending, it could be 30, 40, 50, even $60,000, maybe more even. Buying a car is typically in the domain of a lot of money, for you, whatever the amount is. It's not a trivial purchase. It's not like buying dinner at a friggin' restaurant. If you should have gone for the fish and you went for the chicken and you see, you know, the fish come out over there and you think, that's you can live with that. If you buy the wrong car, it's a disaster that you have to live with for three to five years for most people. So how you should do this, in my view, is eliminate the dud brands. And they're for, what you've got to do is you've got to say, well, what is the definition of dud brand? How do I define dud brand and how do I identify one, right? This is very important to be able to do this. And I've got three criteria for dud brands, right? The first one is commercial criteria, like critical mass and sales trajectory. If a car maker does not have critical mass, like if they're not selling in mainstreamville, if they're not selling 20 or 30,000 cars a year in Australia, they don't have critical mass. And what that means is they don't have enough onshore parts inventory, they haven't got themselves well sorted, they don't have dealers buying into a lot of things that you need the dealer to buy into because most dealers are multi-franchised, right? And that means that if a brand represents this proportion of their total operation, tiny little proportion, they get a tiny little proportion of the operational budget. This means that in the service department, not too many technicians get specific training for that brand. So when you front up with a problem, it's more like, well, we'll see how we go with this one, but we haven't seen it all before. And they haven't had the volume of experience with that brand either. They might not also have a particularly significant parts inventory in the country, and they might be imported by an independent importer, which is typically not as good in the domain of customer service as being imported by a factory subsidiary. Like, 
Hyundai Motor Company Australia, for example, is a wholly owned subsidiary of HMC overseas. Same with Toyota, same with Mazda, same with all the big players. If a player has critical mass, they're usually factory-owned, importer, onshore kind of operationally, right? And if a player starts out, if a particular brand starts out with a small sales volume and they develop critical mass with an independent importer, the company usually looks at it and goes, oh, well, our contract's up with the importer, this independent schmo, and we'll take it over and go ourselves, okay? When, when success looks uh, more or less assured, okay? So for all these reasons, I'd be looking at critical mass. That's absolutely important and also sales trajectory because if a company was here and now it's here, you know, selling up here five, ten years ago, whatever, now it's selling down here, there's a real problem in Dealerville and there's also a real problem back at head office. The problem back at head office is lower sales means less profit and that means how do we cut costs and one of the obvious ways to cut costs is to rein in the cost of warranty and customer support, right? They cut costs in every other area as well, but they're the two that really matter to you. And at dealer level, dealers are saying, well, you know, brand X used to represent this much of our sales and now they're only this big, so we've got to cut back there. We've got to cut back our own dealership resources in terms of what we're doing here. And if you bought in back here and sales fall and you need support, then that's a bit of a disaster for you. So you want brands that are established and maintaining their volumes, kind of like Toyota, kind of like Mazda, okay? And then you've got other brands that are critical mass and growing because they're the ones that are making dealerships money and making car makers money and they've got, therefore, more resources to devote to things that really matter to you, such as fixing a problem that you might have in service in 18 months or two years, are you going to get shafted or are you going to get the support that you deserve? That's very important. And customer support generally, which is criteria number two for me, is really important as well. Some car makers are really just in the money business. They, you think they're in the car business and their website seems to indicate that they're in the car business, but really internally, culturally, they're just in the money business. And the ones that are in the money business solely such as Ford and Jeep, for example, Land Rover, brands like that, they tend not to care about customer support because customer support is just a cost. And what you've got to do is minimise cost and maximise sales, right? And if that's you and you buy into one of these brands, you tend to get thrown under the bus. It's not malicious. They just don't place any emphasis significantly at all on customer support. So that's why you really need to care about that. It's more important than reliability. I'll give you an example of that, right? Two examples. The Hyundai Santa Fe from about, I don't know, four or five years ago, is renowned for breaking its transfer case in service at some time down the track. Like you drive along, something goes click, and all of a sudden your all-wheel drive turns into front-wheel drive because something in the transfer case has been poorly designed and it goes poopy in its trousers. And if you front up at the dealership, you can be well out of warranty. You front up at the dealership and you go, hey, I don't appear to have four-wheel drive anymore, all-wheel drive, they'll go we'll fix it for you, dude, because they have customer-centric, customer-service-centric culture within their operations in Australia. You don't have to fight for it. If you own a Ranger, like a Ford Ranger utility from about three or four years ago, for example, and it's just clicked over, I don't know, 85,000 Ks or more in that 85 to 100,000 K sort of ballpark. It's got a defect, an intrinsic sort of design deficiency as well, where the EGR cooler, this is the thing that takes the hot exhaust gas that's going to go back into the engine to reduce emissions and improve volumetric efficiency at low loads. It's got a cooler for that air, that, that, that inert gas, exhaust gas that's coming back into the engine, right, because it's bad to come back hot. And the cooler fails because it's poorly designed. It's kind of a weak link. And when that happens, there's a danger because the cooling mechanism uses engine coolant, like radiator water, if you like, and when that happens, 
you can lose all of your engine coolant out the exhaust pipe and the engine will then catastrophically fail, which is a major repair. Like, it's very expensive. In that culture, within the culture of Ford, you've got to fight for a fair go. It's not just a done deal that they're going to go, ah, oh, yeah, seen that failure before, we'll look after you, don't worry. Quite the opposite. You really have to fight for it. And in some cases, you will lose. Okay, So this is the difference between investing jumping into, you know, setting yourself up for success or failure because all cars have weak links. They have design deficiencies. What really matters more than reliability is how are you going to get looked after if a design deficiency comes to light, right? This is really just so important. And the final point that I tend to look at when I'm doing this triage sort of hacking and slashing process is brands with no track record, like fledgling brands, emerging brands. Because if you buy into an emerging brand, they always sell on price. It's like always cheap, always seems like such better, quote unquote, value, but it's really just cheap. You are essentially signing up to be a lab rat for the rest of society, running a mad experiment on, is this a good idea or a bad idea? And if you want to do that, then fine. But don't just look at the price and go, oh, this is unbeatable. All cars are equivalent. This one's $15,000 cheaper. Got to be good. Incidentally, a lot of this initial cheapness, discount, whatever you want to think of it as being up front, is often tremendously eroded when you get rid of the car in terms of its resale value. And a notionally more expensive vehicle could actually cost you less to own because its resale value will be higher at the end. And what you're really doing is you're looking at the acquisition cost minus the resale value. That's really what the capital cost has been while you've been the owner of that vehicle. So that's something to consider as well. So if I do this process, I can eliminate 17 of these vehicles off the friggin' bat. I just can't. I think it's 17 anyway. The Atto 3 can go because fledgling brand, right? The Citroen C5 Aircross. Citroen is nowhere in this country. It fails the critical mass test. It just badly fails. The Cupra Formentor fails for having a stupid name and also because it's a fledgling brand and Christ knows how that's going to work out. The Ford Escape, okay, it's got to go. Ford is one of the worst players when it comes to customer support and it's not malicious. They just really don't care about that. It's not a priority for them. It's a friggin' priority for you if something goes wrong. The GWM Havel H6 and the H6 GT, right, failed the critical mass test. It's been here for a long time and it's just not getting anywhere. So until it does, let's put that on hold, shall we? Maybe next time you're in the market for a new car. Maybe it'll have critical mass then, but not today. Honda CRV, like Honda stopped innovating during the global financial crisis. They never started again. Their sales have walked off a cliff in Australia. They're on the brink of collapse commercially. And they've implemented this sort of last ditch desperation move by boning all of their dealers and, you know, just having the stupidest commercial model on earth, which last year was their lowest sales on record in Australia. So this is a failure of the sales trajectory test. Buying a Honda today is a mistake, no matter how satisfied you've been with your last three Hondas. It, that's just how it is. Jeep Cherokee, that's a failure of the support test. You will not get decent support from Jeep if you buy a Cherokee and if it goes poopy in its trousers. It's going to be a dogfight all the way home, basically, if you're Pete Mitchell, okay? Nissan X-Trail. Nissan's the same as Honda, only just slightly further back in the trajectory. They're not quite as far off the cliff. They're not quite as far down on the way to the bottom of the Mariana Trench. That's just how this works, okay? The Peugeot 3008 and 5008. Peugeot has failed to achieve critical mass in Australia after years and years of trying, and in fact, their sales trajectory is 
massively down and has been for a couple of years now. So you've got to scrub Peugeot. You've got to scrub Renault as well because they just don't have critical mass. They're not there yet. The Skoda Karok. Skoda's like Volkswagen. But it's like Volkswagen for people who should have gone to friggin' Specsavers. You've got to scrub it, okay? Same support culture and same fundamental high-level corporate indecency and criminality. Like, I don't see any fundamental change in the way Volkswagen carries on between 2015 and now. Like, I just, sorry, I just don't. But the main reason is not their morality because considerations like that are a matter for you individually. Objectively, they're just crap at support. And buying a car in fully knowing that they're crap at support is a mistake. So that's an easy way to get down to seven. We actually scrubbed 15 then, I think. We've got the fives and the sevens mixed up. You know, don't pay me for this one, dude. Have it on me as a free video. But this means that we are down to seven far more viable choices, right? And that's a much better position to be in if you've got the dough. If you've got the 40 or 50 grand, it's good to go. And what you need to do is have a short list so that you can rationally decide. And incidentally, that short list is the Hyundai Tucson in alphabetical order, Kia Sportage, Mazda CX-5, the MG HS, Mitsubishi Outlander, Subaru Forester, and Toyota RAV4. They all make sense to me in the domain of mainstream vehicle acquisition. There are defensible reasons to have this ve these vehicles on your shortlist and to buy one of them. It's completely defensible. Okay, now you might have a really special usage case where one of these others that I've just considered I've just suggested we delete might work out better for you if you're prepared to roll the dice in numerous different ways. That's on you, okay? I'm talking about your mainstream SUV buyer here. Mr. or Mrs. Average, who's looking at decent transportation first, with decent support, okay resale value, things of that nature, all right? So I'm gonna look at the Tucson and Sportage together because they're clones. Hyundai and Kia hate me mentioning that they're clones, but they are in every salient way. It's the same platform. It's the same set of powertrains. It's a lot of the same stuff under the surface too, like all the IT, the CAN bus architecture and things of that nature. They, they wouldn't go to the trouble of developing independently different powertrains, different platforms, different IT architecture for vehicles of this nature because they're all about the efficiency. They're all about bean counter driven efficiency. So in essence, the difference between them is largely personal choice. But the reasons these are on the shortlist are good support, critical mass, all of that stuff, big tick for all of that. Unfortunately, there are no hybrids in either range, which is a bit of a letdown. And I'd suggest that the diesel is the pick for Tucson and Sportage in terms of drivability, but also if you're environmentally sensitive. Now, this is where facts collide with perception, right? Because diesel offers you the reduction of CO2 production round about 20% compared with an equivalent petrol powertrain. It just does. Physics, chemistry, they're called facts, okay? It might be an affront to people who are paid up members of Club Greta, if you like, but diesel is a more environmentally responsible choice than petrol. It's also better for long distance driving. You'll get a fuel economy benefit as well. And with the way fuel prices are currently in Australia, this does a pretty good job, this reduction in uh, fuel consumption with diesel does a pretty good job to normalise the cost of fuel between petrol and diesel when you look at operation per kilometre, okay? Now, Kia kind of has its balls in a vice at the moment, supplying Sportages, Hyundai not so much. Tucson availability is better, and availability is really a thing at the moment in Australia. And there's a full-size spare tyre on both of these vehicles, which is a huge advantage for Australian operations. It really just is, particularly 
regional driving. Uh, Kia's big trick, the only salient difference apart from the styling, is seven-year warranty versus five for Hyundai. Moving on now to the Mazda CX-5, which is also remaining on our list. It's got a really good two-and-a-half-litre petrol engine. I think the diesel might still be a bit of a dog. Certainly when the diesel was deployed, it was a bit of a dog. It had oil dilution issues, and I'm not sure how well the fix has been implemented. I still occasionally hear about in-service failures there. On the plus side, Mazda is looking after people with uh, diesel engines that do fail in CX-5, the 2.2 diesel. Unfortunately, CX-5 has a space saver spare tyre, which is an issue for longer distance driving because space savers are limited to 80 kilometres per hour maximum operational speed. The space saver doesn't last that long either because it has to be made of really grippy rubber. And the downside there is that it wears out quickly. So if you're a long way from home and you choose to drive home because a fix or a replacement tyre is unavailable, then A, if you've got to drive several hundred kilometres, you'll be doing it at 80 k's an hour, and B, you'll probably have to buy a new space saver when you get home. Pro tip there, space savers are freaking expensive, out of all proportion with the size of the tyre. It's just because they don't carry much stock, right? It's, a, it's not a, a commonly stocked item. So Mazda support... It's okay, it's not as good as Hyundai Kia, Subaru sort of thing, but it's okay. It's, support is not a reason not to buy a Mazda. They're kind of okay at support. You get a proper epicyclic auto with the petrol, with all CX-5s, but with the petrol that I recommend in particular, the two and a half litre one, and this is a salient difference to the 1.6 litre turbocharged petrol engine in Hyundai and Kia, uh, Tucson and Sportage respectively, because it comes with a seven speed DCT and that transmission is a bit compromised. It's nicer to drive an epicyclic auto every time. So hopefully that allows you to weigh up the difference between uh, CX-5 and the twins from South Korea. We're going to move now to the MG ZS. Okay, this is pretty interesting to me because MG does have critical mass. It is the number seven car maker by sales in Australia today. And the ZS, interestingly enough, is the number nine model by total sales for 2022. So MG's got critical mass. Dealers are investing in the MG franchise. You can see it as you drive past multi-franchise dealers. They're not selling MGs out of a shed out the back to someone they can't fit into a Toyota anymore kind of thing. It's an off-the-bat choice. Obviously still price-driven, not as polished as the Mazda or the Twins, okay, but viable nonetheless. And value is increasingly important. Cost of living pressure, blah, blah, blah. You get a seven-year warranty. Now, unfortunately, with the ZS, with both powertrains, the 1.5 turbo petrol and the 2-litre turbo petrol, you need to feed it premium unleaded, meaning 95 octane in this case, okay? This is a case of a cheapish car that demands expensive fuel. And while we're talking about these kinds of negatives, the MG also comes with a 10,000 kilometre or 12 month service interval. So if you're a high mileage driver, service intervals are whichever comes first. So if you drive more than 10,000 Ks a year, you'll be getting that car serviced more than once a year. And most of the competitors from Japan and South Korea have 15,000 kilometre or 12 months service intervals, meaning ultimately I think you'll pay more for servicing with the MG and you'll certainly be back to the dealer more often for a service unless you're an extremely low mileage driver, okay? So there is proper dealership level investment in the brand and the distributorship is company owned. It's SAIC, which is kind of interesting to me, the Shanghai Automotive Investment Corporation, right? LDV is another brand in Australia and it's also an SAIC brand, but it's independently imported by Atiko. So completely different importership sort of architecture for those two different brands, even though someone in the comments is definitely going to say, well, 
LDV is also an SAIC brand sort of thing, right? Unfortunately, just closing off the MGZS for your consideration, it's a space saver spare tyre. Mitsubishi Outlander now. This is interesting too because it's a virtual clone of the Nissan X-Trail. So why are both not on the list kind of thing? You might be considering an X-Trail. Who knows? It's the same fundamental architecture, IT, powertrain, two and a half litre Atmo petrol engine with a CVT. CVTs are not great to drive, but if you're a mainstream driver and it's really just getting you from A to B, who cares, dude? Like, it'll get you from A to B, and they are fuel efficient, and the cost of fuel is a thing at the moment. So there's all of that to consider. There's a plug-in hybrid version of Outlander as well. It's quite expensive, and it's kind of complex, but it's cool in that if you live in the city, you can basically drive a, a really solid distance, 80 k's, I think it is, off the top of my head, on in EV-only mode. You can plug it in and recharge, at home or at the office, and then you can drive for quite some distance as an EV, but then if you need to go for a drive into the boonies, you can just run it on petrol and that'll be fine. So you won't need to do the high-level weapons-grade logistic planning that you need to do if you drive an EV into the boonies. And there are fewer failure modes for that sort of driving exercise as well, because often in the boonies you can get into a situation where you can be going from A to C via B and you really need the charger at B and it could be unavailable, down for service, whatever. That means you're going to plug into the motel and be there for a day and a half or you're just not going to get to C if that one potential charge point falls over. Or you might have to backtrack a significant way and charge up back there and come up with some other plan B. It can be a right pain in the ass. Anyway... The plug-in hybrid version is available. The other big trick for Outlander is it is quite a large medium SUV and it's got the third seating row. So although it's a medium SUV, it's hypothetically a seven-seater. However, I'd suggest that the seven-seat, like seat six and seven are a bit of a torture chamber. So if your kids take friends to the park for something, then it's okay for that, occasional use. But your ageing parents and your kids and you and mum across the Nullarbor, not viable for that, okay? So just bear that in mind. But its additional size can be a real advantage as well. And... Uh, Mal's not going down the Mitsubishi Motors Australia Limited, not going down the gurgler like Nissan is. You also get the 10-year warranty, like that's five years off the bat with an additional five years if you get the vehicle serviced at the authorised dealer. So that's compared with Nissan and its five-year-only kind of warranty. That's an advantage. And with all that in mind, the availability of the plug-in hybrid, the fact that Mal's not going down the gurgler and the fact that you get a 10-year warranty and it's the same fundamental rolling architecture, what is the justification for buying a Nissan X-Trail again exactly? Like, riddle me that, dude, because I'm not seeing it. I'm just not. You might be. Let me know. Oh, yes, in the comments below, as they say. Two to go. Subaru Forester, okay? I, I was a line ball on this because Toyota is just gutting Subaru at the moment, and I so hate that because I've been the happy owner of four brand new Subarus, and I've all kind of liked them, but Toyota upped its stake recently in Subaru, and Subaru is fundamentally part of the Toyota group now, and that means that the bean counters from Toyota have moved in, and they're doing what they do best, baby, which would be getting all the passion. This is the passion that built the Subaru brand, like the passion for rally, which gave us the WRX and the performance derivatives like the STI, and also some really good cars that were sleepers, like the Forester XT, which I owned one of and loved. They're not there anymore, okay? This passion is just not there, and some of these halo models like the STI and the Forester XT, just not here anymore, and that is a dead set shame. This process has momentum, this gutting process, and 
I don't see it being stopped. It's a done deal. The passion will be gone. We're just watching a train wreck in slow motion as I see it. Having said that, though, Subaru's support is excellent. And of the whole model range, like I don't really rate Outback and I don't really rate XV because I think it's a confidence trick more or less. XV cross trek now. XV is really just an Impreza with the hair and makeup done, like we put the lipstick on the pig and now it's an XV. Okay. okay. Commercially, that makes really good sense. Like, that's the way to drive up the profit. But there's nothing special about the XV slash Crosstrek. Know what I mean? It's, it's just not. But Forrester is okay, and the support from Subaru is pretty strong. Forrester's a good size, and I've driven Forrester once or twice, and... It just feels pretty strong. And the symmetrical all-wheel drive, like what I mean is the body integrity feels high in that car. Like I think they've done a good job with the structure, which is so important. And also the all-wheel drive, the symmetrical all-wheel drive is a salient advantage if you want to drive in the boonies on an unsealed road or just on a twisty, wet road because most all-wheel drive vehicles in this category, they kind of quietly drop out of all-wheel drive at about 50 or 60 k's an hour, and they just revert to being 100% front-wheel drive at that speed, unless something horrible happens. And then there's a time constant in catching up, but Subarus are not like that. They're 50-50, all-wheel drive all the time, big advantage in slippery conditions. So Forrester's in. Whereas I think Subaru's on the way out, kind of like Nissan and Honda, but you know, one can live in eternal hope. Finally, the RAV4. Now, Toyota has its fans, and RAV4, in my estimation, is mediocre at best. But hey, mediocrity is kind of what many people want or need when it comes to a new SUV. For, for many people, the acquisition of a car is about the reliable transportation of a family from A to B for the three to five years that you own it. And if that's you, then RAV4 is in the box. Toyota has more dealerships than any other car maker. They're all over the country. They're the top selling car maker. They enjoy 20 something percent market share and they have done for years now. So they're strong in that respect, although they're weak in terms of passion and excitement. A lot of people don't need that. So the reliability, okay, the reliability of Toyota product is not as good as Toyota claims, but <laughs> the claims are pretty Harry Potter now that I think about it. The reliability is pretty good. So is the reliability of Hyundai, Kia, Mazda, like that, okay? So they're up there from that point of view. They've got a bigger support network, especially in the boonies. There's a hybrid, which allows entry to Club Greta, even though... The hybrid is fairly mediocre. And don't get me wrong when I talk about Club Greta, okay? Climate change is real. It's a huge problem. Humans are causing it. It's just that if we get Harry Potter's wand and we wave it and everyone who has a car on Earth wakes up tomorrow with a RAV4 hybrid, it's not going to help. Like, that's just a fact, okay? So... The virtue signalling aspect of vehicles such as this can't be overstated. The hybrid's okay, it's just not exceptional. And uh, in some respects, it's, it's on the, the fast track to being outdated. That's how I'd categorise that. Plus, there's a space saver spare tyre in RAV4, but like most Toyotas, the resale value on RAV4s is outrageously high, which is extremely good for you when you come three to five years down the track and it's time to replace that vehicle that's a happy surprise at the end a literal happy ending and who doesn't want one of those so my conclusion here I am not going to tell you what to buy dude that's not the game I'm in but I am going to challenge you to attempt to buy your next new car rationally in part at least because <laughs> like like I should challenge you to that. This is hardly how I chose my six wives, is it? Uh, incidentally, I don't have six wives. I've got one wife and five exes. But that means cumulatively I did choose six wives and I only chose one of them rationally, the latest one. And, hey, that's working out okay, so that's nice. 
Perhaps I did run the experiment differently the, the final time. Who knows? Anyway, it's not choosing a partner. You just sort of fall. You, you fall, don't you? And then you have to pick up the pieces after. It's not like choosing a meal at a restaurant because there are consequences if you get this wrong. So do it rationally. And the, the acid test for rationality is use facts to justify why you are buying that car. And go through this triage process. Eliminate the ones that don't stack up because although a Volkswagen looks beautiful and a Jeep has that seven slot iconic look and you've always loved it, acknowledge the reality and the, the, the what if. What if something goes wrong? How am I gonna be treated? Because this is going to be the divorce from hell in automotive terms. I know rational argument is uh, sort of a quaint old-timey concept, but it can really help in so many different ways. And I guess the final pro tip there is I don't actually give a crap what you buy, right? But I am kind of in the business of trying to get people into what is objectively the right car. And I see, yes, and I see so many people getting this so fundamentally wrong and setting themselves up for failure. And this is a trend that doubtless will continue until the heat death of the universe. But just because this is a trend and so many people are doing it, that does not mean that you have to be one of them.